everyone. This is the Fivecoin Protocol School, and this is Nicola. All right, Nicola's part. We're going to go through the introduction, uh, high level of the mining cycle, deep dive into the mining cycle, and deep dive into the actors. We're looking into the storage power uh, aspect of the protocol, everything that has to do with mining without uh, counting for block generation. So this is the, the Filecoin logic that gives powers to the miner. All right. So there are two parts. And, uh, maybe this is clear for everyone, but uh, this is very important to understand. There are two parts to the Filecoin protocol. One part is that it is market for storage, which means that you, you ask the network to store a file and you find the miner to store the file. The miner stores the file and they give you a guarantee that the file will be stored through time. And so far, the products are very simple, which is store a file and retrieve a file. The second part is that Filecoin is a storage-based consensus. There is proof of work, proof of stake, and proof of storage. And we are the first proof of storage protocol that deployed in the real world, just in case you want to brag about this. And um, the storage-based consensus does, uh, the idea is the following. If you're a miner and you're storing someone's data, you can reuse the same space from which you're storing someone's data to mine into the protocol. That's, that's the idea. And, and so we want to make sure that the people, this is philosophy, but it's very important. The people that have power, they have control on what's going to be in the next block or more, in, or more theoretically, what will be the change into the protocol are the people that provide services into the protocol, that provide storage into the protocol. That's the important part. Um, there is 2 billion Filecoin. There is a particular amount, 260 million security in supply. We're going to look later at some stats on space gap. So for those that have like fresh from blockchain, I will give you like a very quick presentation on, on the blockchain system, but with a particular eye into the Filecoin, uh, the Filecoin blockchain. When, in Filecoin, transactions are not called transactions. We call them messages. Uh, we'll see why. And a message is from an, act, from an actor to another actor. An actor is an entity on the blockchain. Everything that talks to each other on the blockchain is an actor. So you have a transaction that you want to send money to David. Uh, you send this, tran this transaction to the network. The network accumulates these transactions in something that we call the mempool. And the mempool is this, uh, every miner has uh, somehow receives uh, these transactions and then picks some of them to try to make a block. If they win a block, they, they put a list of transactions in the block and they add this block to the blockchain. And uh, the Filecoin blockchain is uh, different from other blockchains that have, uh, that we may have multiple blocks at each particular epoch. So instead of, call, instead of, instead of saying uh, block one, block two, block three, we, we call uh, time in, in, in Filecoin through epochs. An epoch is a collection of, is a, col is a set of blocks. Um, and one block, so the next block, will link to the two previous blocks in the previous epoch. So, and how many blocks are there in every single epoch? It could be zero blocks, so no one gets to win, or it, and so uh, no one gets to win. It could be one winner, it could be ten winners, but on expectations there is five there is five winners, so five blocks per epoch. So in Ethereum, what's happening is the following: I I, I receive a block from miners. I see the block, I execute the block. In Filecoin, you cannot execute the block because you don't know if you're gonna have more than one block, okay? So what's happening is that in Filecoin, you receive several blocks for epoch X. You need to wait until you see the first block on the next epoch, the links to the previous blocks, to sort those blocks and execute them. Blocks are sorted in hash order, I think. And, uh, and transactions are executed uh, by the order of the blocks. If a transaction appears in one block, it's executed. If it appears in a second block, this is, uh, the second transaction is not considered, is excluded. It gets deduplicated. So this is very important. This, this is the core of many problems that will come later. In, in Filecoin, you don't execute blocks as you receive them. You, you execute them once you're done with the epoch. And the, ne the next block, links to the previous blocks, and now you can execute them. 
every block has a list of transactions and you want to update the balances and so on. Whenever you're done updating the balances, sorry, let's call this epoch X and the previous one is X minus one. When you are at X, you execute all the blocks of the epoch X minus one, you update all the balances. When you update the balances, you up, there is something that is, is called the state. So part of the state is balances, but there is more state that we'll see, that we'll see later. And so this block links to the previous blocks and the parent state root. And a state root is the root hash of the Merkle tree of the state. Um, but what I'm saying is that you can only update the state once you execute the previous blocks. And at and, and, and every epoch, you have an updated state. You have a new state. Can you have multiple states at each epoch? No, because... Okay. This is, this is, the, this is the, the last high-level introductory slide, which is you have the blockchain, and the blockchain, you can think of it as um, um, the list of all blocks. But as blocks come in, you must execute them. How do you execute these blocks? You execute them in the virtual machine. What is the virtual machine? What is this complex name? It's just a state. You can think of it as a state machine where the block comes. The block has a set of transactions. You execute transactions in order. And each transaction is executed in this environment, which is called the virtual machine. And in the virtual machine, you have a set of actors. So there is no transaction that doesn't speak to actors. So what is an actor? Your balance, your account where you spend tokens is an actor. The multisig is an actor. The miner is an actor. The storage market, which is the actor to which you talk to make deals is an actor. And we have other actors and we're gonna go through every actor in a second. But every single time you do an action on the blockchain, you're, you're asking one actor to talk to another actor so, for example, whenever you uh, move money from one place to another place, you say from actor Nicola to actor David. And the function that is called on the actor, each actor has a set of functionalities that can be triggered, methods that can be triggered, is send. When, when, you, when you claim money from the multisig, what's happening is that you're going from your account into, you're sending from a message from your account to the multisig actor, and you're, saying, you're sending a message that says withdraw. So the general idea is that we have the blockchain. In the blockchain, we sit, sits the virtual machine. The virtual machine gets transactions from the blocks and updates every every everything that goes to the virtual machine updates the the, uh, the the virtual machine state. And the virtual machine state is updated um, after every transaction that is executed. And the final state of a, of a, of an epoch gets stored into the, into the next block. In other words. Uh, at every epoch, there is a one final state and that is the result of the execution of all the messages through the virtual machine. Okay, so the virtual machine executes messages that are ordered by the blockchain and uh, each message is from an actor to another actor. An actor is an entity on the blockchain which receives messages and an actor has callable methods that are sent by other actors. And when and this is interesting, but when you send a message to an actor, the actor may also send a message to another actor. For example, in the multisig, you send a message to the multisig, they say withdraw. And the multisig, by it, it, the multisig actor sends a message to the actor to which you want to withdraw, which is a send message. So actors send messages within each other. The, you generally the user triggers a sequence of messages being a, se a sequence of messages being called amongst the actors. Generally, if the blockchain is sitting still, actors wouldn't talk by themselves. There's only one actor that is not triggered by the user, which is cron. We, we have an actor which is the cron actor, and every block the cron actor decides to send some messages to the relevant to the relevant actors. There are some actors. There are many of the same type. So for example, the account actor, there are many. Each one of you has an, has an account actor. There are many of multisig actors, but there are some actors that are singleton, which is there is only one. And this is the cron actor, this one cron actor. There's a power actor, and then there is a market actor. There's one of each. So actors soon. Actors, you reference them. There are two ways to reference one actor. Uh, one is an incremental address. 
and the incremental address starts with T0. So if you're the first actor ever created, you get T0. If you had the second actor, you get T01, uh, T00, T01. And if you, uh, so for example, if we look at the, sorry, it's not T anymore. T was testnet, it's F, F0. But generally an actor has two addresses. One is an incremental ID and one is a, is a, is a robust address. What's the difference between an incremental ID and a robust address? Whenever you say, whenever you receive the the email that you you've been added to the multisig this many uh, dollars, you get a robust a robust address. The difference between a robust address and a um, and an incremental ID is the robust address. It's um, it's a very long address and it's a unique address. And the incremental ID it's a very short address. Now the incremental ID gets assigned through the consensus. So what happens if uh, Alfonso creates uh, a new multisig? He will get, in the, whenever he creates a new multisig, he will get as assigned an incremental ID. But what happens if there is a fork in the blockchain and then Irene gets the same ID? So incremental IDs gets assigned by the blockchain and you need to wait for a long time which we call finality, before they're finalized. So if someone up, comes to you and say, hey, this is my, my F0 address, you want to make sure that they have been having their F0 address for at least a day. Otherwise, it could be that you're sending money to someone else. These F1 addresses are um, addresses generated with a particular uh, key, which is SecP, which is probably... Um, yeah, SecP. There is another ad, which is probably what you all have with ledgers. And then there is some other addresses which are generated with the BLS. It's a different signature scheme. And then T2 um, is the address that uh, that gets assigned to to multisigs and and things and, and 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 so on. So the difference is whenever you create your own account actor, the rob the robust address of your account actor is the hash of your public key. T0 addresses are for incremental. From 0 to 99, they are reserved to protocol labs and to do um, special actor stuff in the future, uh, and so on. Now, each actor has some methods that you can call. So for example, the account actor has, uh, has a method which is send and then a constructor method, which is whenever you create the account, the, the constructor is created. But the idea is that there is a list of there is a each actor has a list of uh, methods and they and and they can be they can be called. Um, there are different actor types. There's you can create many accounts, many minor actors, many multisig actors, many payment channel actors. These are the the ones that you can you can uh, you can create you can create an account actor. You create an account actor every single time that you want to. Uh, you, you have a new a new key, and now there are the genesis actors. These are actors that are in the protocol to stay, uh, which is the I don't know what the system actor does. The init actor, I think, it's the actor used to create new actors. The reward actor is the actor that correctly calculates and distributes the block rewards. The cron actor is like a clock. Every block, every epoch, they decide to do. It decides to send some messages. We will see later what. With the power actor which takes into account how much power the network has and how much power each individual miner has. Um, so, no, sorry, it takes account what is the total power in the network. It takes account what the total power in the network. So every single time a miner adds storage, the storage gets added into the power actor. We will go into details of this. And then there is the market actor. We will not going to talk about it. Uh, there is the verified registry, which is the Filecoin Plus. We will not talk about it. And then there is the super famous F099, which is burnt funds. Every single time you pay fees, or whether it's um, fees due to gas, uh, some of the parts, well, the super famous base fee, which probably we will not touch into it. But every single time that you pay fees, the, they are burnt, this money going to the burnt fund. It, it would be cool eventually to choose what to do with this burnt money. Maybe we can give them back to the to the. I don't know. It would be cool to see to, to see a reuse of these funds. I'm gonna skip gas. The execution model. 
I think uh, um, I told you already what the execution model is, which is you have a, in an epoch, you wait for the next epoch in order to execute the previous blocks. And what you do, you go transaction by transaction, you execute the transactions. And after you've, you're done with the transaction, so you can think of it as a, uh, as a program that goes in a step of one epoch. So we're at epoch zero, and there's a particular state, which is, for example, uh, what's the total power, how much money have people in their accounts, and so on. We go through the set of transactions, and at the end of that, we create a new state. And the new state has the updated power, the updated list of transactions, and so on. We have a new, new set of blocks, we update the new state. At every epoch, a new state is generated. And the state, is, we often call it state three, because the state, you can think of it as a large, um, sorry, as a large DAG. And a message triggers, uh, could trigger state updates. And when people send a message, they pay gas. And what is gas? Gas is how much it costs to do a state update. How much it costs to, uh, how much it costs to, to compute the message, execute the message function that gets called with the inputs that are in the message that update the state. No, this good question. Every actors can actors only update their own state. You can send a message to another actor, and that message triggers a state update, but you don't write the memory of another actor. The state tree is is the state tree is a, the list of all actors, and and each actor is a DAG of the content that they that they care. <laughs>